This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So let's go through and look at another accounting standard. It's another one to do with disclosure. Uh, however, that there could be a very small computation aspect to it with regards to the amount of disclosure that is required. But again, it's another accounting standard that you find hidden at the back of the annual report within all the notes to the accounts. So, and this one's about IFRS 8 operating segments. In a nutshell, all that's happening is that we've consolidated all of our subsidiaries. So you see consolidated revenues, costs, profits, consolidated assets, liabilities, and, and the net assets. Loses all the information about the subsidiaries, doesn't it? You don't know how well each individual subsidiary has performed. Uh, has it done better? Has it done worse? Uh, is it profitable? Is it loss making? What a level of assets or liabilities do each subsidiary have? So following the consolidation where you've brought everything together using substance over legal form, we now have a nice big disclosure note that pulls everything back out and shows a little bit more detail behind the group account numbers. That's it. OK, but. Let's just go through there and think about it in a bit more detail. OK, so IFRS 8 operating segments. First of all, we need to identify what an operating segment is. OK, it's not necessarily just one particular subsidiary and then why disclosure is required. OK, uh, so what is an operating segment? Uh, well, an operating segment is a part of the business whose results are regularly reviewed by the chief operating decision maker, CODEM. For sure. OK, so remember, these are international accounting standards. Uh, so you can't just use CEO, uh, chief executive officer, uh, as the person who regularly reviews the results. OK, uh, so they put in the word chief operating decision maker. Now, what that does is that essentially means it doesn't have to be the CEO. Uh, it can be someone below the CEO that regularly reviews the results. OK, uh, but it's got to still be pretty high level because you know, it was the chief operating decision maker who's responsible if you like, for the ultimate decision. Maybe it is the CEO, but it might not be a CEO in other languages. Uh, likewise, it doesn't necessarily have to be an individual. OK, you know, the chief operating decision maker could be the board of directors. OK, uh, so, you know, it all depends upon on who makes the final decision. Uh, other things to think about there as well is, is the reason why it's a great standard now uh, from what it previously was, is that if it's looking at the results from a, a chief operating decision maker's perspective, that's looking at it from an internal perspective, isn't it? So you're going to be looking at the same results as what the person who makes the main decisions are. So you get a really good internal view of how the business actually works. OK, how do they analyse the position? How do they analyse the performance of the entity? Uh, why is disclosure required? So we've said we've consolidated. We now deconsolidate a little bit in the notes. Because that helps you understand what's happened in the past, doesn't it? OK, I know your management accountants. I know you're looking forward, but we need to look at what's happened in the past from a financial perspective, don't we? And we can target the segments that have improved profitability, have improved revenues. Uh, you know, we can start to calculate ratios for a particular segment. Just start looking there at maybe margins, return on capital employed, etc. OK. Uh, so it really does help you understand the past performance of a particular business. OK. Because then what you can do is you, you've got a bit more detail about those segments. So let's just keep it as a, a subsidiary for now. And you can look at the risks and rewards of each subsidiary. OK. You can look at where that subsidiary is located or you can look at the type of business that that subsidiary operates in. Maybe the location that that subsidiary is operating in it, it is subject to financial constraints or there is an economic downturn within that particular geographical area or maybe a particular business area is struggling uh, because there's launches of, of new technology or maybe uh, there's a new global virus so i think zika is is the, the the local or the local hopefully not too local uh don't want zika uh but you know zika is one of the new global you know, health issues that we have and maybe that will have an impact on on how your business is operated. OK, uh, so, you know, you can start to look at the risks that you're faced with and the level of reward or return that you get. You know, the higher the risk, the higher the return you should expect, isn't it? Uh, and likewise, therefore, what can happen is that the shareholders can make better judgments, can't they? OK, if you've got more information, then surely that's a lead to you as a shareholder making more 
informed judgments about the risk that you're faced with and the return that you get. If you believe that you are now subject to increased risk for whatever reason that may be and are not happy with the return that you're getting, sell the share. OK, uh, if you're happy with the level of risk and the reward, maybe buy some more. OK, so that's what we're talking about in terms of your informed judgment, buying and selling shares. Uh, what we've then got to go through and look at is what must be disclosed. OK, essentially. You can disclose as much as you want, but there's like a minimum baseline guidance as to what should be disclosed. Anything above that, you're more than welcome to. But again, just be careful. The more information that you disclose, the more it's information overload. And don't forget, your competitors will have access to your financial statements and the notes. So you're giving more information to them about how particular segments are performing. OK, uh, so this is where the computations may come in. Uh, what you must go through and disclose is any operating segment whose segment revenue is greater than 10% of the total revenue within the group, okay, internal and external. Uh, likewise, segment profits uh, need to be greater than 10% of the total profits. You must disclose that as an operating segment. Now, we, we could have hundreds of operating segments, but we might not need to go through and disclose some of them. Uh, because they're not big enough. This is all we're trying to do. Make sure that we disclose the large material segments. Everything else can just be thrown into as an, an other segment. Uh, and likewise as well, your segment assets need to be greater than 10% of the total assets. Okay, so we're looking at 10% of the segment revenue, profit and assets. If that's greater than 10% of the total, it is disclosed. If not, it just gets thrown into a category referred to as other. Okay. You don't want too much thrown into the other segments. That's like a dumping ground. If you start throwing too much within there, then you need to ask the question, you know, what, what are we actually disclosing? Because we're not really disclosing much else, are we? Okay, if it's all being thrown into other. Okay, And what they try to do to prevent that happening, there's an additional override rule. Uh, and what you do is once you've gone through the 10% test, you look at what segments are now reportable. And you look at whether or not, uh, I think that's a small typo, okay? It should be correct in your notes. I apologize for that. Uh, total reported segment revenue is greater than 75%. For some reason, I put 10% there. That's copy and pasting. And I've not copied it incorrectly and pasted the wrong number. It's 75%. So you need to disclose at least three quarters in separate segments of your external revenue. If you don't, then you need to take information from other segments and disclose them separately until you meet that 75% threshold. OK, so you need to report at least three quarters separately as your external revenue. OK, if you don't, then you need more segments. OK, uh, just bear in mind, it's a lot to think about, isn't it? It's only done by listed companies, nobody else. OK, so if you're listed on the stock exchange, you need to provide the information for the users of the account, i.e. the shareholders. OK, uh, just notes. Uh, you can, if you want, combine segments together, OK, uh, to make them larger. OK, uh, and therefore disclosing less, I suppose, to your competitors. The key bit there is that they have to have similar economic characteristics. You can't just lump them together just because you feel like it and you want to hide information from the users of the accounts. OK, uh, similar economic characteristics. What does that mean? Well, the product and the services that you offer must have similar economic characteristics. OK, so that the revenues, the costs are all determined based upon the similar methods and similar principles. OK, uh, the production process for the, the items that you manufacture. Uh, is done in a similar fashion. Uh, the type of the class of customer that you have, uh, again, must be similar. Okay. Uh, the methods used to distribute the products or services, again, uh, they must be similar. Uh, whilst also the nature of the regulatory environment itself must be similar. Okay. So again, it's opening up the world of judgments about whether or not we can take two segments and combine them as one. Okay. Again, I'm not too sure how it will get examined uh, via objective test question. I think it's more of a discussion based question. Uh, so let's just have a look at a quick discussion aspect. OK, with a quick example on operating segments. No numbers. Purely, if you like, 
uh, qualitative. Okay. Uh, so what you've got, look at the requirement at the bottom. Advise Gulf as to whether the proposed combination of two operating segments is appropriate. Uh, because what you've got uh, at the top there, you can go through and see it says Gulf is preparing its disclosure note for the first time. Uh, following the fact that it became listed. Uh, the chief operating decision maker regularly reviews the results of three separate divisions. So there's three divisions uh, and they want to combine two of them so that only two segments are going to be disclosed. OK, uh, what you've got is domestic and international railway operations. And is it there your railway construction? OK, uh, in the paragraph below, it says Gulf is intending to report two operating segments in its disclosure notes as opposed to the three that are reviewed. Well, can we do that? Uh, well, it says the domestic and international operations are to be combined because it is felt that they have similar economic characteristics due to the services that they offer. OK, they're saying that they have similar economic characteristics. Is that the case? Remember, we need to think about the nature of the products, the nature of the services, uh, the customers, uh, the regulatory environments. So you need to balance it up. OK. So uh, are they similar from an economic perspective? Uh, if we look at the domestic operations first. OK, it tells uh, your domestic railways involve a competitive tender process uh, to run the railway service, which is then awarded by the local transport authority. So you go to the government, uh, you say, right, we will run the railway for this amount for a period of time. Uh, and what happens there? Oh, oh, careful. Gone too far. Apologies. Uh, the local transport authority then sets the ticket prices, collects the fares, which are then distributed amongst the various operators running the contract. So uh, the government collects the money and then distributes out the money based upon the level of service that, that we have provided and, and, and the customers. However, just be careful for the international operations. That's a little bit different, isn't it? Uh, ticket prices are set by us, Gulf, you know, in the domestic railway. The ticket prices aren't set by us. They were set by the government. OK, so we have no choice there but to stick with those prices whereby internationally we can push the prices up if our costs begin to increase beyond the level uh, that, that, that we feel needs to be passed on then to the customer. OK, so again, if you look at it as well, you know, who collects the fares internationally? We collect the fare internationally, don't we? Uh, whereby domestically was collected from from the government. So if you're looking there at the, the products and services, that the product is very similar, isn't it? Uh, but when you look at how it operates and how it works, I don't think economically you could go through there and say that they hold the same economic characteristics, do they? OK, uh, the regulatory environment is different under both, isn't it? Uh, the domestic operation is regulated by the local authority. Uh, internationally, it's regulated by ourselves, isn't it? So there, I don't think there would be scope to go through there and combine domestic and international railway operations. OK, uh, we would have to go through there and separate those out there. OK. So again, just a bit of a discussion to go through there and, and, and see how it appears. OK. Uh, if we just then move on, it's now looking at what is specifically disclosed. Uh, so you have to disclose your segment revenue as a minimum. Uh, you have to disclose your segment results, so profits. You have to disclose your segment assets and liabilities, any capital expenditure, depreciation, amortization, and any other non-cash expenses, so uh, impairments, uh, share of profits or losses of joint operations, uh, oh, sorry, joint, joint ventures, uh, and there is it, your associates. Okay, they're non-cash, aren't they? Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use Associated British Foods uh, and their disclosure notes to, to talk you through it. Uh, Associated British Foods, it's a food company in the UK. Uh, you may have seen some of those brands before. Uh, Silver Spoon, Sugar, Twinings, yeah, Tea, okay, uh, and then Oval Tea, okay, a malt drink, okay. Allegedly, it helps you sleep. I don't know. Uh, and what I like about it is it's called Associated British Foods because that's what it originally was. Uh, it, it bought the raw materials, the raw ingredients, uh, subjected them to a process, um, then makes that into a final product that then is distributed 
to all the supermarkets. Okay, however, it has expanded over recent years. It's acquired different subsidiaries, and it's doing really well. And it has nothing to do with any of those brands there. Down to that one, Primark. Okay, yeah, Primark is owned by Associated British Foods. For those of you who don't know, Primark, it's a low cost shop in the UK that, that, that specialises in clothes. Okay, uh, and it has boomed ever since the recession. Okay, uh, it's done very, 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 very well, and that's why Associated British Foods has done very well, even though the other aspects of the business haven't. And without operating segment disclosure note, you wouldn't necessarily be able to see that from the consolidated financial statements. So let's just go through and just pick out some of the disclosures. Uh, you don't have to get the financial statements. I've just drawn them up there. Uh, so what you've got, what you can see there is you can see your continuing off, if you like, your statement of profit or loss. So you've got your revenue, you've got your profits, uh, and is it there, your profit for the year. Okay, so you can see there that we've made 12,800 million, 12.8 billion pounds worth of sales. Huge. It's a lot of sugar and a lot of clothes. Uh, they made a, a operating profit of 1.1 million, isn't it? And profit for the year 524 million. Okay. Why? How? Okay. Sales have gone down ever so slightly, haven't they, from last year? Uh, profit for the period has fallen a little bit more, okay, uh, than what we had last year. We just don't know why. And that's why the disclosure note there is relevant, okay? So what you've got, remember the profit figure was 1208, wasn't it, on revenue? So you can see there at the top, the 12800 at the top is then split out, isn't it, into grocery, sugar, agriculture, ingredients, and retail, okay? Retail is Primark, okay? Uh, grocery is essentially all the, the Ovaltine, the Silver Spoon Sugar, and the Twining Tea, and all the other brands that it has. And then sugar, agriculture, ingredients, that sort of like the the, 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 the background, uh, if you like, the, the, the raw material processing that, that goes in then to the, to the groceries that they produce, okay? Uh, and if you just start to look there, you get a real feel of, of how much Primark contributes, doesn't it, uh, to the overall Associated British Foods, doesn't it? Of the 12.8 billion of sales, 5.3, okay, not far off half comes from Primark, okay? And if they didn't have Primark with, within its portfolio of, of, of businesses in the group, they will be doing nowhere near as well as what we, we, we would have anticipated. If you go through there and look at your profit for the period, look, and the profit for the period was 524 million. Uh, the retail makes up all of that profit, okay? You know, 665 million. It's still making profit from the grocery segment, but the sugar is what is whereby we have the, the, the issue, isn't it? And the reason why that issue comes about is essentially it says there, is it profits, less losses on sale and closure of the business? So they've gone through there and, and closed down a, a significant part of the business and that's ultimated or given rise to losses. So hopefully those losses won't be there next year and um, will generate a profit next year uh, on the, the, the manufacture or the production of, of sugar. So taking the sugar beet cane and the sugar beets and converting it into to the sugar that we see uh, in our sugar sachets. Uh, so the use of the accounts there can see a better perception can't they of the past performance you know, the performance this year wasn't as good but that's primarily down to, to the sugar okay uh, the sugar operating segment and if that improves then things are going to improve into the future aren't they okay uh, and things are looking rosy aren't they with regards to primark uh, other things as well you've got there is it your your assets so you can go through there and, and see a bit about the assets uh, you've also got there is it the liabilities okay so uh, abiding by the, the minimum disclosure okay they've also gone through there and put in additional disclosure to do with the assets to do with the liabilities okay uh, and then other things that they've got non-cash items i think there's amortization of intangibles and as well as is it there the share of profit of tax or share of profit after tax from joint ventures and associates okay so giving you specific information there to do with those items okay again in agreement with the standard what isn't there and it's because it's on another page is everything to do with the the, the ppe uh so you've got those at the capital expenditure 
uh, you've got the is it there and the depreciation and also you've got another non-cash item there is it the, the impairment okay uh, again so you can see there uh, you've got 657 million in total of capital expenditure during the year and again you know nearly half of that okay over half has been spent 351 million that column there is Primark. So they're really making heavy investment into its stores again to try and boost the sales and to boost the profits of its most successful segments. Okay, you know if you think about the the food, uh, Ovaltine, was it uh, Silver Spoon Sugar, Twining Tea. Twining's is a luxury brand, isn't it? So in times of difficulty for customers, they'll tend not to buy Twining Tea, and they might buy some lower cost tea. So maybe that segment is struggling ever so slightly but maybe as things pick up again people might go back to drinking twining tea you never know okay it depends on personal taste doesn't it okay but again that's just a little bit of a sample in terms of disclosures that, that, that you could have okay uh, again if you go back uh i'm not going to go through and play around with the numbers uh but remember the the 10 percent rule okay uh, so what you've got there is total sales are 12.8 billion, aren't they? So 10% of that is 1.28 billion. So 1280,000, isn't it? So you can see there that grocery, sugar and retail are all satisfy the 10% on the sales. Okay. Uh, if you're then thinking, well, right, uh, sugar, agriculture, sorry, agriculture and ingredients don't fit the 10% on sales maybe they do for profit the profit was 524 wasn't it 10% of that is 52 so therefore agriculture at 64 and ingredients at 75 uh, fulfill that definition don't they okay I have thought the central uh, column uh, is there isn't it to reconcile it into the total at the end and also the, the assets themselves are probably quite large because they go through there don't they and, and contain if you like all of your head office items okay uh, there we go uh, so let's just skip through those uh, and then just look at other things that could be disclosed so is anything else disclosed other than just the segments the assets the liabilities etc that we've seen there uh, how the operating segments have been identified so who is the chief operating decision maker uh, the products and the services that the group provides uh, is there any reliance on major customers i wouldn't have thought so here uh, with associated British foods and also any geographical information may be given if you've not already provided your geographical information you can provide geographical information for this exactly the same way in terms of the disclosures you know revenue profit assets liabilities depreciation amortization uh, non-cash expenses etc but it's limited to revenue and non-current assets you can disclose more if you wish but that is a minimum, the revenue and the non-current assets. And we'll see that in a moment. So here I've taken the, the note again from Associated British Foods. And you can see there at the bottom of that first paragraph, the board is the chief operating decision maker. So, so they go through, review the, the, the figures and they have the, the final decision. OK, uh, likewise as well, uh, it, it talks again about it being from an internal perspective. So the group's operating division is based on the management and internal reporting structure, which combine businesses with common characteristics. So, you know, that, that there are, if you like, some segments that there are maybe that have been combined to give you, was it the grocery, to give you sugar, to give you agriculture, ingredients and retail. OK, so there's, there's, there's going to be a, a lot more subsidiaries within those segments, but they are, if you like, the ones that they can group together with the similar economic characteristics. And again, you've got there the five, if you like, operating segments that the business has. It explains what each of them does. So again, in the sugar, I think you can see there it mentions is it, uh, it they supply it to Silver Spoon, okay? Uh, which is there is it part of the, the grocery part of the business? And then retail, it mentions there is it Primark, and also one I think pennies. I think that's uh, in Ireland, isn't it? Okay, there we go. Uh, and then just other bits and pieces, uh, obviously, when we looked at your disclosures for the operating segments, we looked at it by business. Uh, here, you've just got a bit of geographical information. Uh, they've got it there via revenue from external customers. 
and they've got the if you like is it the segment assets and you can see the uh, the AB Foods 12.8 billion dollars worth of sales uh, they are the majority are within the UK there's a significant amount in Europe and Africa and then the rest uh, still make a significant contribution but by no means as much as what you had previously okay uh, so that's just a little bit of the, the disclosure that's required. Again, I think from an exam perspective, in terms of the questions that you, you're going to be asked, uh, it, it's going to be potentially non-computational, I'd have thought, uh, asking you why do we go through there and have the standard. Uh, so to help you understand the past performance, the risk and returns, uh, or the risk and rewards, and make better judgments. It might ask you specifically what is disclosed, with regards to the assets, liabilities, revenue, profits, uh, non-cash expenditure, uh, capital expenditure, amortization, depreciation, etc. Okay, or it could ask you to say, is this disclosure most appropriate, uh, and identify the areas where maybe mistakes have been made. Uh, so using, if you like, the ten percent rule on revenue and profits and assets, and that's seventy-five percent override. Okay. Uh, other than that, uh, that's it in terms of that session. I'll see you all when we pick things up within the next session.